Ja, lepo pozdravljeni, spoštovani kolegi, kolegice in kolegi, dobrodošli na vsako letno strokovno srečanje, pogled na odprto znanost. Letos jo organiziramo desetič in prvič po video konferenciji, vemo žal razloge za to. Prvič pa tudi v pomoči nastajajočega kompetenčnega centra odprta knjižnica. Za podporo se zahvaljujem tudi kolegom v Univerzitetnih knjižnic Univerze na Primorskem in Univerze v Mariboru, ter Centralni medicinski knjižnici, še posebej pa našim partnerjem Scientific Knowledge Services, ki so nam še enkrat več priskočili na pomoč pri organizaciji tega dogodka. Moje ime je Miro Pušnik in bom z našimi današnjimi gosti, gostitelj naslednje tri ure. Tema današnje konference je zelo zanimiva, skupnostna znanost oziroma tako imenovana Citizen Science in njen vpliv na družbeno okolje. Ker pa imamo na naši konferenci tudi goste iz Tujine, bo kot vsako leto jezik našega srečanja angleščina. Sproti bomo delali po vzetke slovenskem jeziku, če bo to potrebno. Preden pa priklopim na angliški jezik, naj vas še spomnim, da lahko vprašanja postavljate po spetnem vzbrazcu na slido, sli.do. Šifra dogodka pa je hash odprta OS 111 nič. In če vse zakitvitate oziroma uporabljate državne omrežja, hashtag OS 2 nič leje. Zdaj mi pa dovolite, da priklopim na angliški jezik. So, dear colleagues, welcome to the annual meeting Focus on Open Science in Ljubljana. This year we are organizing this meeting for the 10th time. 10th time, but first we are teleconference. We we all know why is why and yeah, it's very pretty. But we hope that uh, uh, next year we will be uh, uh, again live. And first time with support of Competence Center Open Library. I have to thank to Scientific Knowledge Center Services for the support, and also I would like to thanks to our colleagues on the University of uh, University Libraries of the University of Primorska and University of Maribor and also to Central Medical Library for their support. My name is Miro Pushnik and with our guests today we will be your host for the next three hours. The conference topic is very interesting citizen science and uh, its impact to the broader community. Uh, before we start, uh, I hope you see, I would uh, now uh, I, I shared uh, my screen. I would like still remind you to put any questions to Slido. Slido, uh, Slido where you went, code is uh, hashtag uh, OS1110. Uh, and also the Slido forum is prepared uh, uh, on conference web page, so you can uh, put uh, questions directly there. And uh, uh, again, uh, for using on social networks, please use hashtag uh, hash OS 20 Ljubljana. Uh, today we have four presentations and on the end, uh, there will be a short panel, uh, 45 minutes or something. Uh, we, uh, and there will, you will be able also to put additional questions to our presenters. And yeah, just a few words before we start about citizen science. Now research is becoming an imperative component of everyday life where individuals and uh, volunteers, researchers are offered various, uh, various possibilities and alternatives uh, in their homes and broader environment regarding problems they try to solve and regarding IT resources and consoles they are able to use them like uh, mobile phones, uh, uh, etc. Citizen science includes the experimental knowledge or of a wider circle of non-professionals. We can say non-professional researchers and the general population in the research work of professional researchers. Its importance is growing in the research environment and in the community in general. The mission of citizen science is knowledge sharing, involving non-professional researchers in citizen science research projects can be a bridge between local community and research organizations. Uh, now presented concrete experiences serve professional researchers to verify theoretical basis and as a source of new ideas for their fields of activity. Last but not least, citizen science makes it easier to understand scientific work and to apply the results of this work to the life of wider community. As we are 
uh, academic library, I can say that academic libraries play an important role in citizen science. Through their activities, they promote networking between researchers and wider community, and thus can become a kind of an incubator of, for citizen science projects. Now it's time that we start with presentations, and I'm glad to represent you our first, pre uh, our first presenter. Our first, first presenter is Dr. Huma Shah. Huma gained her PhD uh, in deception, detection, and machine intelligence in practical Turing tests from Reading University in 2011. From 2012 to 2014, she worked as research fellow on the AUFP7 funded RoboLaw project since 2014, she has been with Coventry University uh, researching and teaching artificial inte uh, intelligence trust and also artificial intelligence ethic. Today, she will present a citizen science project which research trackers on the internet. And uh, Huma, uh, uh, it's your uh, work. So please. Uh, so first of all, good morning, everybody. Um, can you hear me? Can you all hear me and see the screen? Yes, we hear you. Okay. And see the screen as well. Fantastic. Thank you. For, I love it when technology works. So thank you very much. Um, I'm really honored to be um, asked to give this presentation about a, a citizen science project that um, um, I'm working with, also with a colleague here today who will be presenting uh, later, Dr. Tiberius Ignat. Now, our uh, citizen science project is concerned with our online privacy. So I'm giving you a quote here from Privacy International that the internet is plagued with trackers. And I will explain what that means. So what I'd like you um, to do now is to go to Slido with the code that's already been um, passed to you. Uh, so I invite you to look at this question. The question is, which of these companies listed here, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, or another, which of these big tech companies do you feel do not protect your personal data online? So which of these do not protect your personal data online. So if you would kindly go to Slido and uh, put in your question. So if I may now move to the next slide. So here I'm going to show you a very few seconds clip um, about the internet. I hope you can hear this. And we're back here with Brendan Kehoe and you've logged on to Internet Brendan. Before we take a look, What's the big deal about internet? Why is everybody making such a fuss about it? Why is it better than CompuServe or Prodigy, et cetera? Well, the chief benefit is that it's not owned by one company or even a conglomerate of companies like Prodigy or CompuServe. You're influenced by what those companies thought your users would want to do. Where on the internet, anyone can put any service on and have it do anything they want with it. At so any it's kind time. of user control. Right. It's, it's completely molded by the people who use yeah. it. All right. Let's take a look and show me some of the neat. Okay, so that was the noble um, that was the noble idea about the internet that it was would be user controlled, that it would we could put in anything we wanted. It wouldn't be controlled by companies. Now we know that is very different. So if we look at the uh, the big companies and we see how recent they are compared to the age of the internet from the ARPNET of the sixties, we have Amazon, which is only twenty five years old. Google, 22 years, uh, Netflix, 22 years, Facebook is only 16 years old, but what a massive impact it has on the world's population that are online. Gmail, 16 years, Twitter, 14, iPhone, 13, WhatsApp, which is now owned by Facebook, 11 years, Uber, your um, call driver, call service, 11 years, Instagram, 10 years, Zoom, which we're using now, eight years. So these are really very recent uh, technologies, but they have a very pervasive influence on our life now. And this uh, means that they have an impact on our human rights. 
So just to remind you of what the human rights are, what rights have been accorded to us after the atrocities of the Second World War. So the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights included this statement, no one shall be subjected to arbitrary interference with his or her privacy or correspondence. Another article in the 2000 EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, it states that human dignity is inviolable. It must be respected and protected. The 2018 General Data Protection Regulation GDPR, it sets a very high standard for consent. Consent meaning when they're asking us for information, the big tech companies or smaller companies, websites, whatever, they should make it transparent what they're asking us to give up in terms of our personal information. This informed consent under the GDPR entails offering us real choice and control, which is what we had in the early days of the internet, which has eroded with the onset of these big tech companies. It means giving us genuine consent so that we are in charge of what information we like to um, uh, release. For example, if you have an app on your phone which tells you when the ne next transport is due, whether it's a, a, a train, bus, a metro, you have to give your location to know when the next uh, a bus, train, whatever arrives. So you know that you need to give some personal information, which is your uh, precise location, right? This is because you need to build trust and engagement. There is no reason for any other information for that app to have about me, such as my sexual orientation or my age of uh, my age, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so this is it. It should give us charge of our data, whom we give our data to, what data we release. So Microsoft um, has uh, the CEO, Satya Nadella, he has stated tech companies need to defend privacy as a human right. But is this followed by Microsoft? No, it isn't. This is Microsoft Online. When I went, went, this is just yesterday, just yesterday I went somewhere online on Microsoft and it said Microsoft and our third party vendors use cookies. Hang on, cookies for what? Uh, to deliver ads, improve our services. I, I really don't care about Microsoft services. All I wanted to do was to look at an image. You can select all, uh, accept, or you go to the manage cookies or privacy statement. This is not in the spirit of the GDPR because it's not being transparent. So this is Microsoft. Now, this is Google. It tells you, this is google.com. It's telling you what a cookie is, that it's a piece of uh, technology in your browsers, allowing websites to make your internet experience better. That's what the claim is, that this is what cookies are for. Cookies, pieces, uh, software, text files, embedded in websites and in apps on your mobile phone and smart devices. This is the, because we're talking about citizen science, this was this year's citizen science conference. As you can see, there's like a cookie banner and the accept is really bold, but there's very little transparency on what this accept is. There's just a very faint couple of sentences about cookie policy. Now, this is the European Citizen Science Conference uh, website. This is our, my university's uh, website, massive cookie wall, before you can even access what this university offers. And so can you imagine parents looking at this website for their children? If you have a look, the accept all is very, it's in your face. The reject, if you can see, the reject is very faint down at the bottom. Again, this is not in the spirit of the general data protection regulation. It's not transparent on why they're using cookies to provide the best browsing experience. To me, this is not the best browsing experience. If you go to a website and you immediately are hit with this kind of wall, and this is like everywhere. It's ubiquitous across the internet. This is uh, nature.com. We all know nature uh, journals are, are really popular, high impact. 
This is a, a, a business um, online journal, Business Insider. Again, this is what you receive before you can access any articles on Business Insider. Spotify, people who have Spotify, again, when you go to online, we and our partners use cookies to deliver our services. What's that got to do with the user? Very little information about it. Doodle last week, and um, we had a Doodle poll to decide a date for our uh, Citizen Science Project Consortium meeting. When I went to fill in the Doodle poll before I could, I, I got this uh, uh, screen, I got this image. Beneath, I went beneath that, I thought, let me look, let me manage cookies and go beneath what the heck is going on. And it's got, you have to scroll down and manually turn off all the requests. And as Tiberius pointed out recently in one of our consortium meetings, the companies now have this new excuse to extract our data, our personal data, um, called legitimate interest. What is that legitimate interest? God knows. Now, for me, this is the worst excuse. The next one I'm going to show you, this to me is the worst uh, website homepage and the worst excuse for cookies. Um, uh, the company's House of uh, Com, and this is what it says. We use cookies because if we don't, you can't buy stuff. What? Where's the transparency? Where's the compliance with the general data protection regulation? So this problem, it's huge. We now know from, I showed you the video, short video clip earlier that the internet was supposed to be run by the users, for the users. It's been taken over by big tech and other companies. This problem is not going away anytime soon. Companies are thriving on this cookie data collection business model. And the data that they're collecting from us is anything and everything that is on our mobile phones. So it's our contacts, our um, friends, our images, our uh, everything. Um, also, I would recommend having a, a look at this Netflix uh, docudrama, uh, The Social Dilemma. It interviews uh, the Silicon Valley techies who were behind Google, Uber, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and it was their uh, naive idea of doing positive for the world, which has actually been about data collection and dividing society. But yeah, I recommend that just to like go up at how, how naive could they have been. Um, so coming back to Privacy, Privacy International, um, they are doing similar work to what our project is doing. And I will explain about our project, but I just want to tell you something shocking that Privacy International have uncovered. So they went on the internet to look at the tra trackers to see what data was being collected and how uh, people were being targeted with ads. Privacy International wanted to know whether online depression tests are sharing information about their visitors with others. Think about this. So these, these are online mental health uh, websites. What information are they collecting on the people who go there to find information? How can they get over their depression or what can they do to make themselves happy? What is being shared about them with others without their knowledge? It's quite shocking. Privacy International decided to take an in-depth look at three uh, depression test websites in France, Germany and the UK to find whether the information that people provided when they went to those websites were, were the data processed securely. So the web pages that Privacy International analyzed contained a shocking number of third party trackers. That means when you go to a website, for example, Coventry University, the the data goes to somebody else without your knowledge. So it's not just staying with Coventry University, for an example. So a third party is somebody not connected with that website. In the case of the French website, the depression test page contained 48 third parties the moment the website was opened. Another example was the depre uh, depression website in Germany, which contacted 30 trackers. So Privacy International study found trackers from all the large tech companies. These are the third parties, Google, Facebook, Amazon, also 
from data brokers, so ad tech marketing companies, um, such as Outbrain Taboola. The GDPR, this is totally against the general data protection regulations, which is uh, setting a high standard for consent, which means offering individuals real choice and control. Genuine consent should put individuals in charge. It should build trust and engagement, enhance the reputation of the website owner. Consent should require positive opt-in. But as I showed you on the Google uh, Doodle Poll website, you have to manually go in and, and tick off to exclude yourself from legitimate and any other third party tracking uh, uh, activities. Explicit consent requires a very clear and specific statement of consent. So now I would like to see what the poll results showed. So if I can go to, um, let's see if we can go to, wow, 94% Facebook, fantastic. You are so right. Fantastic. Thank you very much, people, for uh, completing that poll. That's really interesting. And you're not far wrong. It is Facebook. And that is um, the hypothesis that we have underlying our citizen science project uh, that Tiberius is also uh, sorry, part of. Uh, one second. Sorry. Let me just make that um, from here. So there are tools available on online so when you go to a website if you want to know are there any cookies there are tools that you can use to, that will um there they've got algorithms that will crawl the website and tell you what cookies there are um there, there's no standard tool but these are some of the uh, uh tools that are available so you can check uh, beneath websites. There's also one for apps, but we, we are um, looking at that for our uh, citizen science project. So these are the kind of tools that we will be suggesting people look at in our um, uh, project um, to check websites as well. So this leads us to why we decided to create this citizen science project to look at online privacy, because our online digital um, uh, rights are being eroded. So for this uh, citizen science project, we are levering the citizen science methodology. So in other words, engaging the general public throughout the project from core investigation to core innovation of a repository of trackers. So they're not just being um, recruited to collect data for us. So we will recruit citizen scientists from across Europe and beyond uh, Firstly, this is because we are an 11 partner consortium with the partner spread all over Europe as well as Israel. We will informally educate and train the citizen scientists on informed consent allowed under the GDPR and also um, show them, give them the skills to check for cookie third party trackers in apps on mobile phones and also underneath uh, websites. So we will engage citizen scientists as online privacy investigators, and we hope that they will be motivated because it is their personal data that is being uh, uh, compromised. So citizen scientists will join the researchers on the CSI COP uh, project consortium to explore beneath websites and Android apps. So the outcome of our project aims to uncover the tracking cookies. And yet our hypothesis is that we're, um, Facebook and Google trackers are spread across the web and in apps. From the uh, data that we will collect from the researchers and the citizen scientists, with the citizen scientists, we will co-create, we will innovate an accessible uh, knowledge resource. For example, think of Panama Papers that um, um, you can search to find which politician in which country has money hidden in Panama. So we will create an online repository of tracking cookies in websites and in apps. We aim this way to improve the scientific literacy of European citizens, informing them of their digital and human rights, etc., and also about uh, online privacy, uh, and also hopefully encouraging people to develop privacy by design artifacts or 
hopefully we're going to attract some software developers. So this way, we will be raising awareness of the rights accorded in the GDPR. So it's a proactive uh, uh, um, a project, citizen science project. We're wanting to uh, create a movement where we take back our free will. We control our free will and we don't have our data just um, extracted without our consent by third parties. We don't allow the erosion of our right to privacy. We protect our human rights through this citizen science project. Um, so we make the general public become informed citizens because we're all uh, citizen scientists in a way. We can all become privacy champions and stop accepting cookies on websites. And hopefully we stop purchasing from sites that violate our right to choose. That's it uh, from me. Thank you very much for listening. So um, any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Thank you. Yuma, Sorry. thank you very much for this uh, very interesting and uh, very, let's say, um, uh, provocative presentation about uh, what we live uh, every day. Um, uh, there are a few questions in Slido, so I will, I will go uh, question by question. Uh, first of all, uh, it's one question um, about uh, is it a solution not to use big services or should we educate users to use them but carefully and with all the options they save the, the, their privacy? I think that we are talking about internet literacy. Uh, am I right or please correct me? I think you're right. We, I mean, we can't stop using the services of Google or Amazon. We can't. We can educate ourselves about our rights and we can, it is at the moment a bit of a pain that you have to manually switch off trackers. But hopefully, as, as this movement grows about, and you can see in America, they held an antitrust uh, big uh, uh, report. So th th this movement is growing, not just from our little project, but it's growing. So eventually, we will start going back to like the early days of the internet, where there was no privacy erosion, where there were no third party trackers. So we will go back to uh, uh, designed by privacy, data collection by uh, 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 data privacy and data collection, you know, according to our privacy. So at the moment, it's about us becoming, uh, 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 becoming educated about how we can stop being tracked online. Thank you. It's another question, very interesting. Can you give us some examples of useful software tools that we can use to protect against trackers? Uh, in my knowledge, there are few uh, and far between. Um, I, in one of my slides, I did give um, uh, one of my slides had um, the some of the tools. I'll share the screen again. Sorry, uh, I stopped sharing. So if I share my screen again, uh, share again. So, yes. Yeah, so can you see this screen? These slides will be available. Um, I've already uh, passed them on to this uh, to the organization. So these are some of the tools that are available for um, checking websites and for um, apps, it's this one. For apps, it's Exodus. Exodus. So these are tools. So for example, you can check. So I use Transport for London. I live in London. So I use Transport for London app. Oh, sorry. I use Transport for London TFL. There it is. So it's got four trackers. So you can go to it. Yes. Yeah, so you can use Exodus for apps. And then um, there are these tools for um, websites. Okay, there is a very interesting question also about um, using cookies uh, in, um, let's say, governmental environment. Are governments using cookies and uh, in a dup uh, doubtful way? Okay, so th that's very interesting. Um, uh, I'll just give you an example of my university. I know it's not a government, but it's, uh, you, you know, it's a university and it's the same with uh, websites. Last week, our university, uh, sent a message to the whole um, the staff and students said download this safe zone app it was telling everybody this will help you when you're on campus to make sure you're not near somebody with covid i went beneath the app so i wrote then to the the senior 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 management in the university i said are you aware that these this app that you're promoting has all these um uh 
tr third party trackers, Google, blah, blah, blah. And it's got all these permissions in the app, which give the app access to your uh, contacts, your photographs, uh, allow the app can change your SD card on your mobile phone. And the university was quite shocked. So they went to the the external company um they went to the external company and said one of our staff has said this the external company came back and said we don't even use those trackers we don't even use google they're, they're, they're just there so this is what the problem is whether it's a government website or uh, whomsoever that these environments in which you create a website the platform like wordpress or the environment in which you create for example an android app they are environments created the, the standard tools that have got automatic and embedded trackers that's the problem so it's not the government probably don't even know that their websites have got trackers because the platform wordpress or whatever they've used have got embedded trackers and we we can say that for sure because when we built our project website the csi cop website using the wordpress platform we had to manually take off all the embedded trackers to make our website privacy by design. So the problem is we need to educate students uh, who will become software developers that when you create an app or a website, whether it's for a e-commerce, whether it's for a government, whatever, don't leave the trackers in there. Check for the trackers and take them out. Thank you, Huma. Uh... Huma will be also uh, a part of uh, our panel on, on the end. Uh, she will participate in that, so, so we can discuss those questions also uh, on the end of the day today. Uh, I will now um, uh, represent the next presenters. Uh, they are coming from uh, the University of Southern Denmark. Denmark. Um, the next presentation will be presented by uh, Ms. Anne-Katrin Overgaard and Thomas Karstedt. Um, and is uh, head of external project at the Faculty of Health Science, University of Southern Denmark. Together with Thomas, she co-founded uh, in 2017 the uh, uh, University of Southern Denmark Citizen Science Network. She is a citizen science advocate and has been project manager uh, for a long range of citizen science projects, especially within health sciences. She also project manager for the ongoing work for the um, FNSHD's project at the Faculty of Health Science and probably uh, she will represent this project as well. Uh, Thomas is deputy, uh, deputy library director at the University of Southern Denmark, as mentioned together with Anne. Uh, he co-founded uh, USD Citizen Science in 2017, uh, USD Citizen Science Network. He's an open science and citizen science advocate and has been project manager also uh, at some projects, uh, citizen science projects. Um, very important, he's also co-chair the Liber Citizen Science Working Group uh, in two, uh, 2020. He was library fellow at the University College London with the focus on designing a citizen science strategy. So uh, please, and please, Thomas, go ahead with your presentation. Thank you, Miro. Um, as I think we stated, uh, and Katrina is currently uh, in for a scan at the hospital, so I will be presenting on behalf of both of us. So please bear with me while I try to get my slides on. Will you please tell me when you can see them? Can you see my slides, Miro? You are muted. Can you see my slides? Yes, we see. I see your slides. Well. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, the, and also for having me in this uh, Focus on Open Science series. Um, the presentation today is Citizen Science at the University of Southern Denmark, or SDU, which we also in the daily manner uh, talk about is the power of many. And that also goes within the University, uh, I represent the library, but there's a critical thing in citizen science that libraries on a number of levels can play a critical role in this. Uh, and Katrina Overgaard and myself came up with the idea of trying to establish a citizen science infrastructure in 2017. 
and has together with five faculties uh, tried to build this up also with the library. And as Miro uh, stated, uh, we both are uh, members of the Libra Citizen Science Workgroup. I can see that Mitya and Tiberius is also present. And uh, if you work at libraries with citizen science, are interested in citizen science, we are more than happy to have you on board. So I'm going to talk about four things briefly within sort of 20 minutes, and hopefully there are questions. First, from an institutional level at SDU, how do we organize? What is the governance structure on citizen science? How do we interpret citizen science? Because citizen science could mean a lot of things. Uh, I will briefly present a number of cases. And then again, uh, in our opinion, partnerships within citizen science is absolutely crucial in trying to establish what we want to do. Uh, so we have a few observations and a matrix on that. So citizen science uh, really could be a lot of things in the modern sense because citizen science and involvement of citizens in science has been going on as long as science has been on this face of the earth. Um, but at SDU, uh, we acknowledge that natural science is sort of the epic center in modern times, uh, but we think about citizen science in a much more broader sense. We see it as public engagement with science and we see it uh, as a tool and a, and a, and a dialogue between uh, citizens and researchers. So at SDU, the power of many, the Citizen Science Network is a partnership between all five faculties, our very large university hospital, which has a working relationship with the health science, which Anna Katrina presents, the university library and our research support unit. And that is to say what, how we organize it with the steering committee of the deans of faculties at SDU. But in reality, we work with at least 25 or 30 partners in our regions in all capacities. Uh, so the way we try to organize it now, it's a very simple model. Uh, it's no secret that the uh, concept of a bespoke, broad spectred engagement in science that Tiberius and Paul Erich from UCL Libraries has come up with is an inspiration for what we are trying to establish January 1st, which is a knowledge center of citizen science. But right now our working uh, theory really and the network is that we have a citizen science network with resources and a lot of partners that are pitching in that are doing really facilitation. We have researchers on one point and we have the public engagement uh, in another point. And this public engagement goes much, much further than the three examples we have mentioned, uh, building a little bit on something Huma, uh, you came up with uh, or, or related to science literacy. We work quite heavily with the school system in our region as well. Also, as Miro uh, mentioned, uh, SDU, as we believe, would be probably the only university that we are aware of that has 100% strategic commitment to the UN uh, SDGs. So uh, beginning uh, last year, uh, the SDGs is a driving force in the strategy and the strategic commitment, and also some of the funding opportunities internally at SDU. So SDU want to uh, create value by working towards the UN SDGs. We will develop skills and capacities to encourage uh, innovative solutions for a more sustainable world. And we would want to contribute to molding a sustainable future by breaking down boundaries and removing limitations. So when we work at uh, Citizen Science at HEU, uh, we have been working with that for almost three years, but the UN SDGs, also the EXA conference that were in Berlin that had done the uh, declaration on Citizen Science SDGs the next decade, and also public libraries who both in IFLA and IBLIDA is really having a strong orientation towards the UN SDGs. That is a prime platform for libraries, for researchers to tap into in the future. So at SDU, and I'm not going to cover them with every single case that I go through, but it's important to say that uh, SDU has done a number of SDG challenges that runs across 
our 3,500 researchers and employees and 30,000 students? How could we move and be more uh, health oriented? How can we more make more sustainable transport? How can we be going green in buildings? And the Green Deal calls that are coming up uh, or have a deadline here in January, several of our researchers are within citizen science uh, trying to do work packages in consortia with other researchers on this. But briefly, uh, before I move on, I think it's uh, quite important to stress briefly also for this group because citizen science tends to be in a lot of directions, how can I reply apply at my own university or my own library what citizen science is. But I think it's important, and I think we sometimes in libraries at least forget that it's part of open science. Citizen science uh, and open science has a lot of conjunctions uh, where we can tap in. Uh, this one is from Eva Mendes and could probably be updated, but I think it's very, very good in trying to establish this whole mold of what we are trying to accomplish and I think uh, some of the uh, points made by Huma in your presentations probably also would work into this, but at least in Eva Mendes' uh, uh, outline, uh, citizen science could be the sum of all these good initiatives, building towards open science, more sustainable science. Uh, but again, critically, and, and this one and the next one I'm going to show from uh, Muki Hackley, this is Jala Gulambik, uh, perhaps a little old, and, and, and the next one is also from 2013, but it's important to always stress that citizen science could be about inclusion, contribution, and reciprocality in citizen science. So we work on that model and discuss it with our researchers, probably in every project. And also within this, um, we have a talent program for graduate students at uh, SDU, that I co-chair together with a design professor called Jakob Buhr. And when we had our uh, exams and the, the projects that were trying to establish citizen science with students, we challenged them on that if they wanted to do citizen science, this could be a model to see what kind of citizen science they were actually trying to achieve. So it's just to say that there is a framework that could be used and I think I've read, at least in a Danish context, many misconceptions that people use the term citizen science in all kinds of way, also within science communication. And it could also be science communication, but I think it's important to stress that there is a quite clear taxonomy or models or theories within citizen science. And also within data, there's a clear connection to trying to establish new data frameworks within citizen science and if you work in any capacity with data in citizen science, I will strongly urge you to check into this framework that uh, these researchers are trying to establish. So the main part of my presentation that I will try to do in the next sort of uh, 10 minutes will be a few cases to see what can you achieve or what can you build? We have been going on with citizen science since uh, 2017. And some of the cases that we have worked with are very, very different and have very, very different scope. So the first one is within health science, really within health literacy, democratic aspects, and also the very, very difficult aspect in a welfare society where welfare and health services from hospitals, if we wanted to achieve what all citizens wanted hospitals would have to double the budgets, which is also in a pandemic an absolutely impossible exercise. So what we have been doing since 2017 is we have tried together with our first local hospital, but now with all hospitals within our region. And in the region of Denmark, we are 1.2 million as citizens. We have tried to discuss these things by trying to put five research citizen science projects out to citizens together with a local media partner or media partners in order to let citizens decide which projects should actually be funded. And that gives a healthy discussion and a healthy dose of critical thinking into what is citizen science, what is it not, what can it achieve, and how can citizens 
and researchers and hospital work together in this very difficult conversation where also NGOs, at least within some of the major diseases, are trying to in some way monopolize the conversation. So what we have trying to achieve is to, to build a dialogue. And in 2019, we, we did this project and it culminated just last week. So we don't have data from 2020, but it's to say that if you facilitate this conversation with a media partner, we reach in the vicinity of 500,000 people uh, through social media, and we got 18,000 people to vote for these projects. So there is a possibility to engage in this era of fake news and post-factual society and COVID-19. There are still platforms and windows where you can engage citizen in meaningful fact-based research conversation on citizen science. Also in a total other ball game, um, we have engaged uh, the citizens around our university in trying to uh, engage them. And we have these 80 acres of farmlands with approximately 30, 35,000 citizens living in suburbs just nearby. And we have a citizen population of around 200,000 people in Odense, which are a number of surveys show that they want more influence in how to uh, direct their daily lives and trying to do co-creation within how to use the very sparse nature around our city. So together with our active living unit, we co-created a process also with the media partner to try to see how we could transform these farmlands and forests into a living lab for movement and uh, really open science. So that gave us a thousand inputs uh, the critical and difficult part is, of course, to get funding, because when we were finished with all these good projects, it cost in the vicinity of 20,000, uh, sorry, sorry, 20 million euros, which were absolutely out of our reach. So we tried to implement some of the easier ones and have begun that very difficult process. And one of the limitations in citizen science, as Professor Nuki Hagley, which taxonomy I showed before, has put out, Getting funding for open-ended research, at least in Denmark, is very difficult. But we are trying this difficult process in trying to get funding from some of these citizen-led and co-created uh, ideas. Also in a more uh, sort of perhaps traditional way since 2019, we have been doing a, a marine tracker project. Um, marine life around Fyn with these small whales that we have in a very, very heavy uh, population is really difficult for researchers and very costly to try to track. And there are only 10-year uh, uh, studies every 10 years around Denmark to trying to track where these small whales are. So we are engaging citizens of all kinds, uh, even tourists coming to Denmark. Uh, and since 2019, what we have uh, is a very, very large sighting studies where also a good a healthy dose of data and dialogue with why do citizens want to engage in these projects? And uh, perhaps quite unsurprisingly, a large number of these citizens are care about the environment and the interest in marine life. But what we found out is that uh, the top scorer in these, this project is that people want to contribute because they care about the local community and feel that uh, activities and research that could benefit the local community and engage them were actually the top scorer. Um, this project also uh, called Bring Your Own Device. We engaged uh, a large number of citizens around uh, uh, Fyn to collect electronic waste because uh, one of the least sustainable industries in the world um, is, uh, besides what we heard from Huma and her project, uh, this industry is unit by unit, one of the least sustainable in trying to recycle uh, electronic waste. And there is a built-in uh, mode in a lot of uh, these devices that means that they cannot be repaired and parts are not available. So there's a gigantic waste within this. So what we did uh, during a four week period was to collect and tag e-waste together with a reciprocity campaign in order to try to 
apply to citizens how much they could actually pollute less if they use their devices more. And that ended up with 17 big industrial containers of research data that uh, were stuck for a couple of weeks before we did a workshop and sorted it out uh, under one of our faculties. Also, we are engaging uh, uh, high school students and folk school students during Find a Lake and opening January 1st, we are engaging the same segment in projects uh, within science literacy that I'm going to talk very briefly about within the humanistic department. So it's to say that within a few years, uh, we were able to engage quite a large portion of both our researchers from all faculties. Uh, we have seven or more, eight projects that I could also lay out. The library has built infrastructure management, uh, data uh, stewardship, uh, project management, uh, communication, science communication, and a lot of the things that are mentioned also in the bespoke model that Tiberius has laid out. Um, and building on that, uh, two points before I conclude, Miro, and uh, if there's time for questions, I would be more than happy to do that. Um, we find true inspiration um, in the article uh, by, or in the framework put out by Paul Erich and Tiberius Ignat, um, in trying to establish a knowledge center on this. We think, and also it's no secret that Tiberius and myself had put, have put forward to EXA uh, on the General Assembly in November that we would want EXA to establish a working group within universities for citizen science. Because as much as we respect and want to work with researchers at SDU, we can see the benefits of a stronger and more focused collaboration at universities and between universities uh, within citizen science. And there are some true examples, uh, citizen science center in Zurich, uh, some of the new things that are coming out of University uh, College London within their new strategy. So what we are trying at SDU, building on what Tiberius and Paul has laid out, is a single point of contact for citizen science, but also the library would probably be the prime initiator of this, but in a true partnership with research support units from all faculties and uh, IT department, research and grants office, with some of the things that are mentioned here. And when we work with that, it's important to say that a bespoke at SDU would look different than one at Ljubljana or another university but there are a very good framework to build on and also communicate to faculties. And building on that, it's important also to acknowledge that this bespoke is not only a partnership within the university, but there are at least four sectors. You could apply civil society, public sector, private sector, and in education, where we find a lot of partners already that we would want to commit to. Also within that, and I find it very interesting that uh, the first presentation mentioned uh, science literacy, because if we want as citizen scientists or advocates for citizen science to get a bigger reach, there is a prime opportunity within the learning system or university system. And that is try to educate from the ground up our own students, uh, undergrad and graduate students, PhD students, um, within what is science literacy. Um, and I find it interesting. Um, we are trying to do a program now, uh, building on what Huma said, where we want uh, tech students to build infrastructure as curriculum for a citizen science project. And we take true inspiration from some of the things from the first project to our, try to put into that as a component that we probably haven't thought about. But science literacy also within high school students and public schools is a method in trying to evaluate or discuss and plan, not if students are getting good grades or from a didactical standpoint, but to see if citizen science and science in general could give meaning to that. And building on again, uh, my last point, what Huma said, if we work within tech and uh, software engineering, computational thinking, 
is a clear one of the competences or literacies, but it has a lot of uh, contours to that citizen science and scientific literacy is seen to begin merge. And if we want to engage public schools and high schools, our uh, experience so far is that it's much easier to tap into these system systems if we can discuss with teachers, not only how could you use it in the curriculum, but why is it good and could it be used to motivate students? So I think I spent 21 minutes right now. I have a healthy dose of references that would also be shared afterwards. It's important to say that anne Katrina Overgaard uh, helped present this presentation. Uh, so thank you right now for having us for this. And Miro, if there are any questions right now, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you, guys. Um, thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, I should say that uh, it was very interesting presentation. Uh, and uh, we have some questions here, so we, we will go, uh, we will list those questions at just a moment that I find the slide on. Uh, so, uh, first question is um, uh, obviously very important because uh, uh, it was four likes. Okay. Uh, so first questions. Uh, uh, first question is very important. It, uh, it got uh, four likes. Uh, what support are you given by the university headquarters? What support are we giving from the university headquarters? Uh, the easy way to answer it is not as much as we, as we would want to. I think um, university upper level management are at SDU extremely keen on results and impact. SDU measures itself on all kinds of excellent impact lists all over the world. And citizen science, of course, is about excellence, but it's also about social impact or societal impact, which is problematic and difficult to measure. So the support that we are giving our seed money, we have gotten access on a limited number of employees. But in reality, what happened is that my library director, Bertil Dodge, has sort of taken uh, up this and are beginning to apply library personnel and extra seed money, which sort of have wakened uh, the their university management up a little bit. So we have gotten after this and also trying to build our bespoke we have got uh, funding for a talent program besides that, and we have gotten funding for a cross-faculty uh, project for uh, within dementia. But it's sort of dripping along slowly. And I think if citizen science at STU is to become sustainable in the long run, we need external funding in order to make it happen. Thank you. Um, another question uh, which were put, um, are your citizen science project uh, open also regarding open publication and sharing research data? Uh, yes and no. What we find in reality is that a few uh, seasoned citizen scientists within natural science would apply to what I would call state of the art within that. But a lot of researchers are still in Denmark at our university, very new to citizen science. So I think our data management support group, and I think that is also the key takeaway from a Danish national uh, project that are publishing our results uh, only next week, that data management and citizen science is pretty much about educating or advising researchers how to be open because besides they have to learn the trade of citizen science, at least for the first time, then they also need to be open and transparent and have DUIs and publish the data in a structured state of the art way. So to be honest, that is a struggle. Uh, and there's a learning curve for researchers, at least at SDU within that. 
Oh, thank you. Um, there are also two questions. First is, um, is your university citizen science approach a part of wider university strategies? I think on, on uh, probably in the field of open science. Uh, yes and no, because it's a very, very curious thing with SDU. And I don't know if that applies to your own universities. SDU has an open science strategy. It took two years to get it through all necessary red tape to get it published because every single institute, and SDU has 37 institutes, every institute had to okay it. So it took two years. And when it was finally published, and I would also say this, uh, but perhaps a little more uh, mild tempered at home, a lot of things happened. So we really had to revise it. It was sort of already a little too old before it got out. And now we are starting to do a new strategy. And also within the SDGs at SDU, there is no clear cut connection. But what we are in, what we are sort of getting into is that SDGs are trying to do citizen science project, but it could be more explicit and it could be more open and it could be communicated better at our university. Okay. Then we have one comment, uh, which is probably do not be answered, but it's interesting. Science literacy, science literacy sounds perfect. So I, I, we all agree about, but there is uh, the last question uh, for now. Um, probably we can talk about those uh, problems also uh, at the, our panel. Uh, so would you involve or are you involving public libraries as partners in such projects? Uh, yes, and I would be happy to elaborate in the panel discussion. Oh, perfect. So thank you very much uh, for now. And we are going now to the next presentation. We have two presenters and they are coming from Slovenia. Uh, uh, Professor Čertomir Podlipnik and Professor Marko Jukic will present very well-known citizen project COVID.sc. And I, I, I can say I'm glad and honored to mention that CTK was one of the early supporters of this project. Um, so Čertomir obtained his PhD in the field of theoretical chemistry at the University of Ljubljana. Afterwards, he joined the group of Professor Anna Bernardi at the University of Milan, Italy, where he was involved in designing of cholera toxin inhibitors. Currently, he's working as an assistant professor at the Faculty of Chemistry and Chemical Technology at the University of Ljubljana, and his research interest and focus is on exploring relevant biomolecular systems. And with his valuable comprehensive knowledge in the field, he's actively involved in a number of projects, including Ebola research. And also, uh, Marco, uh, Professor Marco Jukic is an assistant professor in the field of pharmaceutical chemistry, working at the Faculty of Chemistry and Chemical Technology and the University of Maribor, and he's founder of bioinformation company in Telemore. He's involved in the design of new active substances, bioinformatics and development of computer tools for design of new drugs. Uh, so please, uh, dear colleagues, to start presenting and sharing your presentation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So I hope that my pre presentation is on. Uh, yes, I, 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 we can see, I hope so. I, I see your presentation. Okay. So first of all, I have to, to thank to the organizer that invited our team to present our citizen science project COVID dot se i will start with well now quote of sun tzu the famous chinese general he said if you know the enemy and know yourself you need not fear the results of a hundred battles so in our case the enemy is invisible and is named coronavirus. 
So we will check this enemy very briefly. Coronavirus, cis are named after crown spikes located on their surface. Four major subgroups groups of coronavirus exist, and human cor coronaviruses were discovered in mid 1960. So in time, time when we um, we went to moon. Common human uh, coronaviruses from Corona viridae subfamily uh, are here. And uh, coronaviruses are our everyday companions. Sometimes coronaviruses, oh, okay. Which usually infect animals can be skipped on humans. This is very dangerous because humans do not yet have any mechanism to place defense to the to the infection. So, uh, COVID nineteen is very very huge global health problem. So this slide is taken in October twenty seventh. And we can see that in that time was more than 33 million confirmed cases and one and 15 deaths, but one approximately one week later, there is 49 confirmed cases and 1.24 and something that so uh, this is very huge problem and scientists worldwide search for solution to eliminate this COVID-19 problem um, here we can see the graph that represent number of scientific publications when the corona when the corona virus is used as keyword so the scientific interest starts in here uh, in the 60s and of course co coronavirus publications uh, reach first peak here when we have SARS, original SARS, and then again MERS. And nowadays, this graph is, is from February 9, 1990. And in February 1990, there was 700 papers about coronavirus, and now, in uh, November, we have more than five fifty hundred articles related to coronavirus. So there is huge scientific interest uh, to find a solution to stop to eliminate uh, this uh, coronavirus problem. So here I will present three projects that engage citizens. And first project is COVID Moonshot Sprint 4. In this project, scientists are engaged to model protein targets. And then we have the project Eterna. So in this project, uh, citizens try to develop mRNA vaccines through the game. And then we have also well-known project Foldit, 
Uh, this project is to model small proteins that inhibit binding virus to the host cell receptor. So there is, are examples of very well known and well accepted uh, citizen science projects with long history. So in this place, I will present two Slovenian citizen science projects. So first one is COVID-19. This project is uh, for collection, analyzing and publishing data on spread of coronavirus. And this is our project. Within our project, we allow general public to participate to fight against coronavirus by sharing their knowledge and computer resources. So here is how uh, our initiative begin. So first in the December 19, we identify the problem with uh, from literature and media reports. So then we discussed over the beer and uh, find a solution to create uh, some joint web-based workplace. Then in February, we get idea to set up web presence and set up social network. And in this time, February, March, we start with our project. And uh, this project evolved very briefly. So uh, in um, April, we have some scientific community and private sector endorsements. Uh, this is him of our community computing. So our idea is to use such network. So uh, we in a data ser server, we have ligands and targets and uh, we share, uh, we have data server and clients, computational clients and data and from computational clients is used for calculations on the client. And then the data results are returned to the, back to the server. So this is very basic uh, scheme. It's, it is far more complicated that we can see, but what is important that clients could be very different uh, so we can use Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. So we have plan also to Chrome and, and Android. So here is two examples of our clients. We develop a graphical user interface client for Windows and common client interface clients for other free languages, our other free uh, um, operational systems. In all clients, user can set up the number of trees, trees he wants to allocate to the project. The graphical interface has also a very interesting option to switch on a screensaver, which can be used for promotion of Slovenian touristic attractions. So the instructions for using COVID SI uh, is in Slovenian, English and Russian. So uh, we developed also some tools for analyzing. Uh, currently we are saving best 10,000 poses for each target target ranked by total score 
to MySQL database and we use uh, Viewer to explore uh, the complementarity between receptor and the ligand. So in this figure, we can see really nice complementarity, shape complementarity uh, between receptor and the target. What is important, we intend to publish some results as, an, as open data. So uh, here is some example of dissemination of the project. Uh, our project was more or less warmly accepted in the general community. We already did some presentation of our project. For example, here is CSA meeting in April 2020. And as we can see, uh, very famous speakers are also along with us in this in this uh, CSA meeting. So uh, we prepared also a web page for presentation our project. Uh, our web page contains important information about our virtual screening missions, results, and, and statistics of the project. Our web page is in Slovenian, English, and Russian language. And uh, what is important, our set, site has also blog news section, and you can send your own contributions in Slovenian. English or Russian to info at COVID SI. So here we can see the statistics of our COVID SI projects. Uh, we, our current performance is to screen approximately 10 million compounds for two targets in one week. So our big wish is to screen 1 billion compounds. So this would take more or less one year with such performance. So uh, we are also monitor which computers are mo most active in the project. Users can identify on computer by client ID. And I hope that this is good. Uh, that this is in line with GDPR rules. So now uh, Marco will continue more with more details about our technology and scientific background. So Marco, your Hello, everybody. Um here you go can you see my presentation yeah yeah okay perfect uh so uh i will spice up uh this presentation with a little bit of science so here uh if we just uh, uh take another quote so stretch strategy without tactics is um not uh, not not optimal shall we, shall, shall we say so uh, to present here is the zoo of SARS-CoV-2 proteins so if here we can see the genome of the virus and uh, here are all the proteins that are encoded by this genome uh, so some of these uh, proteins here can be actually used as potential uh, drug targets so potential therapeutic targets and Actually, we are examining this same problem. Uh, here uh, is uh, a large picture of a coronavirus. I guess everybody has seen before, with a key uh, key proteins uh, that are that are designated by certain letters. So M, membrane, E, envelope, S, spike protein, and N, nucleocapsid. And some of these proteins are actually also examined by our project. 
Um, here are the related, other related targets that we are also working on. Uh, and just uh, maybe to emphasize one is the first target is free CL Pro or main viral protease. That is the most examined target in the scientific world currently. But uh, um, in the lines of our project, we're also examining some other uh, potential targets and some other proteins that are actually not that studies currently, and uh, we can afford to take a look at them. Uh, so here to briefly uh, talk about the life cycle of SARS-CoV-2 virus. So upon binding to the receptor, virus gets into the cell. Uh, sometimes it's uh, encapsulated by the endosome. And after uncoating, the viral RNA is released and translated to polyproteins. And these proteins after proteolysis um, uh, encode a special replicate transcriptase complex that, that, that then can transcribe to uh, certain uh, subgenomic RNAs. Uh, these are then translated in the endoplasmatic reticulum, that is the cell factory of the proteins, and then translocated to Golgi apparatus, that is a logistic center. And the prepared viral proteins then can combine with replicated viral RNA and form fully formed viral particles that are then released into the environment. And we are actually examining some of the proteins that are deeply involved in some of this, some of these stages in the life cycle of the virus. For example, we'll ma mainly look at the proteolysis, this is step four step, and the proteins that are involved here in the viral life cycle. So here is the first strategy, is to prevent virus entry into the host cell. And here is the depicted is a spike protein bound to AC2 receptor. And here the, we would like to screen a library of small molecules to find binders. Um, and maybe design small uh, or even large molecules that are able to interrupt this interaction between spike protein and AC2 receptor. Uh, another strategy is also prevention of virus to escape from the endosome. And here uh, are various approaches, maybe lysomotropic agents, uh, endosomal lysosomal protease inhibitors or inhibitors of clathrin-mediated endocytosis. These are various approaches that we are actually looking into. Uh, the third strategy is disarmament of viral proteases that we will look uh, a bit uh, in more detail. Um, and here we would also like to design small molecule, molecule covalent and non-covalent inhibitors of viral proteases. Um, here are two examples of compounds that are, uh, that are bound to a viral protease active site and are able to block uh, the action of the protein. Here uh, is depicted is the free CL Pro viral protease. And uh, we will look just, uh, just the colored section. And if we enlarge this, this is the viral protein and emphasized is the active site of this protein. So here we are actually looking for the ligands or small molecules that are able to bind into this active site of free CL pro protease. So how does it look like? So here you can see a whole cloud of compounds in various conformations. And this is actually how it looks like when we dock various molecules or their conformations to the active site. And throughout this cloud, we are trying to discern which molecule and which pose is actually able to favorably bind to our protein and maybe, maybe inhibit its mechanism. So here are some of the compounds identified and the pose of certain compound in our target and then follows uh, the whole chain of further research. But the, the point here is the very, very uh, computationally intensive search for potential compounds that we are performing. We are also doing some other strategies. So viral E-protein, we are examining it. It is uh, currently very under-researched targets and we are, uh, we are currently studying it heavily, uh, heavily how, uh, how uh, it's involved in the viral life cycle and how can it be used as a potential therapeutic target. Uh, 
Then we are looking at, of course, spike protein, how we can inhibit uh, interactions of two protein surfaces. And of course, TMPRSS2, uh, transmembrane protease, um, how can we inhibit this, this uh, host protease actually, and in this way, inhibit viral entry into the host cell. Um, so here, uh, I would like to conclude with this short scientific uh, presentation, and I would like to uh, offer a sneak peek. Our project is uh, received very favorably in the scientific community, and so we are currently preparing also a um, Boeing project that will be available. Uh, it's currently in the testing phase, uh, very successfully. It will be SciDoc at home. And please stay tuned or on our covid.si site um, where the login details for the Boinkers will become available. And we are very looking forward uh, to this collaboration. Uh, now, um, really, I would like to wholeheartedly thank to all participants for their support and their help. Together, we are definitely more effective and we can help each other. I would uh, personally like to thank uh, Mr. Miro and CTK for their continuous support. And I would like to thank previous panelists, Huma and Thomas from BDU. Uh, Thomas, your speech was really inspiring and I look forward uh, for uh, similar projects and I, uh, I hope we will work together in the future. So all the best from me and thank you for your attention. Um, thank you. We have a few questions here. Uh, so I suggest that we go question by question. Thank you very much for your presentation. Very interesting and very, uh, I'm uh, always impressed uh, when I see uh, uh, your presentation because it's something, it's something that, uh, yeah, uh, that uh, we are really hit right now. Uh, first question, um, it's for Chert, for Chertomir, for Chert. Uh, so, uh, how did you crowdsourcing uh, volunteers? Uh, this is a very nice question. Um, in fact, we started uh, with this project from scratch at the beginning of first epidemic, and we perform all uh, these our solutions in one week. So, um, and uh, in one week from the beginning of the project, we were on national TV and we got more than a, a few thousands or even more participants on our system and our system was crashed. So now we decided to do, to be a little, bit more conservative in uh, this advertising. And uh, in fact, uh, we, we uh, let's say, are still in trial phase. So we did not any call for new participants. But we have very, a lot of, uh, participants and a quite decent um, comp computational power. So uh, we are very, very grateful also to all colleagues that develop uh, this, uh, our solutions, especially for Bostian Laba, uh, Jan Pevets and Gaspar Tomšić, the guys that really work hard to, to and push uh, this uh, project uh, further and further. Okay, thank you. Then the next question for COVID.SC, I think for both of you, is this project international and from which countries are coming participants? Definitely, uh, COVID.SI is an international project and participants are uh, from all over the globe. And especially now that the Boeing project will, uh, will fly off uh, into the public, we will get participants even more from all over the world. So you can just join, uh, go to covid.si if you're interested and uh, take a look at the instructions. It's just a short comment, if you allow me. Uh, it's very difficult to organize citizen science project within, let's say, one organization. 
And I, it's really, I think that you need huge efforts uh, to invest, to, to organize this on a globe, globe way. And I, I'm not sure that there are many citizen projects which are uh, so global. So this is more maybe additional uh, interesting uh, point. And uh, yeah, uh, for Marco, I think for both of you probably, um, is this your first citizen project and what are your impressions? Yeah, uh, I think this is our, our first citizen project, uh, yeah, for the whole team and our impressions are very, very good. Mm -hmm. So in the future, we will definitely follow on with this scheme and, uh, and uh, develop uh, all our uh, efforts and uh, the projects will, will have a huge follow up into the future. And uh, I really look forward to working with this. Okay. And there is another question about uh, research data, probably. Uh, will you share uh, your uh, data, probably your research data, in a f in, uh, within fair, uh, uh, let's say, concept, uh, in a fair frame, like it was said in Slido? Definitely. Yeah. Okay, so we can conclude that this project will be like in the light of open science from the early uh, beginning till the end. Uh, so it's, uh, it could be kind of uh, a good case. I mean, good practice for uh, all other uh, researchers. Uh, okay, so thank you very much for this interesting, um, uh, let's say presentation. And we will, we will be able to discuss maybe further in a few minutes uh, after the last presentation. And the last presentation will be uh, done by uh, uh, Dr. Tiberius Signat. Um, Tiberius uh, has a PhD in library information science from the University of Bucharest. Uh, currently, he's director of scientific knowledge services and I can say that we collaborate for many years, very close, uh, especially uh, 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 organizing uh, uh, those meetings. Uh, uh, the first uh, meeting uh, in Ljubljana where we collaborate was in 2015. Um, he runs um, in a partnership with UCL Press and Liber Europe, a series of uh, focus open science workshops. Uh, uh, I think that last year, uh, uh, it was in more of 10 European countries. Um, 11. 11, yeah. After being an individual member of Liber, he became a liberal associate and Tiberius is very active in the field of uh, citizen science. He's a member of European Citizen Science Association and Citizen Science Association and also uh, in the scientific committee for OA, uh, OAE 11 uh, conference in Geneva, uh, the Chern Unique Workshop on Innovation Scholarly Communication, by the way, allow me to, uh, to let's say, um, uh, say about this conference, it's perfect, so uh, uh, when, when you have a chance to attend it, uh, it would be uh, very, uh, very, very uh, interesting for you, be sure. Okay, T Tiberius will uh, present um, uh, a very interesting uh, subject, uh, how to organize uh, a unique uh, reference point at the university uh, for the citizen science. So please, Tiberius, go ahead. Hello. Uh, can you please um, tell me if you hear me well? We hear you perfect. Okay, thank you. So uh, thank you once again for um, co-organizing this event in Ljubljana. Uh, for all presentations and speakers so far and for inviting, uh, inviting me here to present. I have to maybe um, say, say that I haven't invited myself, although we are co-organizers of this event. And I'm very, very happy to see that citizen science is considered a very important topic in, in Slovenia, uh, which in this way is, um, is a leader, a, a European leader in um, giving importance and giving the right place of citizen science. Citizen science is a pillar of um, open science as defined by European Union and, and other bodies. Um, maybe it's not getting the, the needed attention, but that's understandable. The phenomenon is old, but newly uh, taken up in uh, universities. So I <clears throat> want to thank you once again also to, to all uh, Slovenian uh, co-organizers, University of Maribor and Faculty of, of Medicine, 
we started with CTK in 2015, this series of events, um, with, we have now over 26 chapters. Uh, I would like to, 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 present, to make my presentation in a video format, uh, because we prepared uh, this presentation in, um, in, a, in a way which delivers better the content. I will be on during the, the, um, the whole presentation plays, and then I'll be here, of course, for questions and uh, answers. So uh, my, to my colleague Goran, if you can please help me uh, now playing the, the, the presentation. Hello everyone, my name is Tiberius Ignat and I run Scientific Knowledge Services, a small company which works with research organizations for disseminating trustful knowledge and transitioning to open science. We are honored to contribute to the development of citizen science, especially in what it means the participation of research libraries in this practice. I am presenting today Bespoke, our prototype for a citizen science point of contact at research organizations. For those of you less familiar with what citizen science means, it is one of the open science pillars as defined by the European Commission Open Science Policy Platform. It stays next to responsible research inf indicators fair data, open access, and four other important pillars, all designed to make research more open and reproducible. So what is citizen science? It is a scientific effort which involves lay citizens to actively contribute to research activities with their intellectual effort knowledge, tools, or resources. It requires, before anything, to give attention and respect to researchers' activity. The purpose of this presentation is to create conversation around our prototype for a citizen science single point of contact, a concept which was first introduced in October 2016 by the European League of Research Universities. Lero. Citizen science single point of contact is a rather long term. For this reason, you will hear me speaking today about bespoke, which means broad engagement in science point of contact. A terminology what which we first introduced this year in 2020. I'll be back on that terminology side in a little while. All right, a single point of contact for citizen science. First, from where this idea came from. If we go back in 2016, as I mentioned before, we will notice an important advice paper issued by LERU, the League of European Research Universities. This advice paper provides, even today, some of the greatest guidelines for embedding citizen science in the life of universities. This kind of activity existed and it was known long before in universities, but mostly at the laboratory or department level. The novelty of this advice paper, however, is the upscale of citizen science to the level of the organization. Written as a recommendation for institutions, the single point of contact for citizen science is suggested to the leadership of universities to advise scientists and to ensure liaison with the national and regional citizen science initiatives. This is the paragraph which raised the idea of such a single point of contact. 
Now, that short break for terminology. To become a circulated idea and to be introduced easier in our conversations, we think that the concept of a single point of contact for citizen science needs a shorter term. I wrote together with Dr. Paul Aries, the Pro Vice Provost of UCL, an article which was published this year in which we speak about embedding open science in European universities. In it, we per propose an international terminology for this single point of contact. We propose to generally call it BESPOKE, which is an acronym for Broad Engagement in Science Point of Contact. We think this little detail, among other actions, will help turn this recommendation into a practice. So, since 2016, we have the recommendation of creating a citizen single point of contact, a bespoke, but it didn't become a practice as far as we are aware. Citizen science remains a novel idea at university level. Even the final report of Open Science Policy Platform recognizes that for most stakeholders, the progress in this area is still in the early stages of discussions, planning, and some initial implementations. However, we picked this rec recommendation right away and we pushed it forward. We did so via a series of events called Focus on Open Science. Introductory speakers explained I was a historian, so I am a historian, so many of my examples are historical examples. Znanost za državljane, državljanska znanost, citizen science. We want to um, change the paradigm of research in library and archival environment. You can uh, participate. Competition, in my opinion, is good as long as it is constructive, and you can achieve that by collaborating in the same time. We also organize many workshops like the one we are here. via journal articles, conference presentations, including the annual conference of LIBER, the Res uh, European Association of Research Libraries, UKSG, European Citizen Science Association, and so on. We also push this in one-to-one uh, -one conversations, in master classes, and even in consultancy. Bespoke also represents one of the strategic direction of the Citizen Science Working Group, which I recommend you to consider joining, not only the group, but also LIBER as a network. But what would such a bespoke look like? Well, we at Scientific Knowledge Services have been prototyping independently such a concept since 2017. In that year, we first mentioned roles for European research libraries in citizen science world. That happened at the Liber conference in Patras in Greece. Our bespoke prototype has nine elements. I will present them here to the core of each element and we will discover in one-to-one -one conversations the details that is making this bespoke. So, first of all, the first element, it's a platform in which to build and continuously update the institutional policy for citizen science, including a concordat of interest between involved stakeholders. That could be laboratories, PR offices, safety compliance offices, scholarly communication offices, data center, training center, center and similars. The visible part of this policy platform will be a continuously updated report. This is the first element. Next to it, it is a portal. A portal which contains information about citizen science activities at your organization and possible beyond that, in your city, in your region, in your domain of research. Third element, various frameworks 
for partnerships in citizens around citizen science. Such partnerships could take place between units, departments belonging to the same institution or with third parties like other organizations because citizen science is a complex approach to research and very often requires such partnerships in order to happen effectively. An example could be a partnership between a university and a museum or with a crowdsourcing platform. Further down, our next element is represented by a collection of templates for citizen science activities. Examples are data sheets, protocols, training methods, training materials, checklists, reports, evaluation forms. It is now demonstrated that the quality of citizen science data is highly dependent on the consistency of your training programs. And how easy is, for example, to follow the protocol, which means certain ways to design the protocol. A collection of templates certainly helps and I predict that it will be in high demand at your institution if you start citizen science activities. And here we are at the fifth element, specific research communication. Scientific communication in citizen science world has its own style. It should preserve the quality of peer review, no doubt about that, but it rather needs to abandon the scientific jargon or the discipline jargon when we address to citizens. As Bespoke will offer such a symbiotic system, not only to ignite, but also to facilitate the scholarly and lay communications. This element of Bespoke will be able to contribute to the promise of research impact to increase the dissemination of research and, very important, to stimulate, to enable the recruitment for citizen science projects. Our next element is a connector. This connector will plug the interested research groups with your research office. It will be a point of reference to help scientists embed citizen science in grant proposals, and it will most probably offer services of scouting for grants, proposals, or for editing. Citizen science is not yet the obvious route for funders, although Horizon Europe will apparently be insisting on the collaboration between science and society. Don't forget also the industry could be a shareholder in citizen science. Hence, the important role of research office and the connection that is needed between that office and your research groups. The seventh element could be an easy one or a difficult one. It is a desk, physical or virtual, which offers a gateway for the public to propose research projects. It will be an easy one when there is a sort of harmony driven by curiosity or by the ambition to fix the unknown, a harmony between researchers and the public. On the contrary, it will become a hot potato when such harmony is broken, when the public need for new understanding and for innovative solutions to their problems is not very close to researchers' agenda. This entry point in such case might become an intrusion point from the researchers' perspective. We don't have much time to insist during this presentation, but there could be certain strategies to achieve merry work in this area. I am more than happy to engage with you, as I said, in one-to-one -one conversations. We are now coming close to the finish line. The eighth element is another connector. This time, such a connector is aimed to provide the legal confidence by connecting the citizen science activities with the relevant departments of universities that oversee the legal and safety matters. Example, your organization is running a field study and you want to make sure that whatever unhappy event happens, your organization employ the right diligence to avoid it and to have it legally covered. A second example is needed, you set up a price for the most relevant lay contributor to a citizen science 
project. How do you know that the rules of competition are rightly set from a legal perspective to determine who wins that prize? Last, by all means, not the least element, is a portal for building a community of participants. This portal would, could be very much the same or different to the activities portal that I mentioned before. It depends on your engagement strategy. The community, the community builder portal will make your organization an active member of the society. It will reward both researchers and scientists with an interactive space, a space for friendships. It will facilitate recruitment and retention, and it will be very important and to combat the volunteer burnout. This community builder is the right place for citizen science players to make a contribution to the effort against societal imbalances like gender participation, races, and other issues that are on the rise now. Because this is what a community is doing. Remember, a community is neither created nor managed. A community is nurtured. So this community portal, part of a more complex bespoke, is so much important for the success of your research activities when it comes to citizen science. This portal and the communities that it can nurture, it will, will help your organization become and better serve the society for which it exists become a better member of society. This is, in a nutshell, our bespoke prototype. The single point of contact for your institution for engaging scientifically with the broader society. Now we like to be consistent. For those of you involved in the library development, in 2019 in Dublin, we worked with a group of LIBER members to identify which are the preferred areas of action to LIBER libraries in citizen science world. These are the areas which were, which were distinguished as most suitable for action. Libraries to build a bridge between science and public. Libraries to build and support infrastructure in citizen science. To develop trainings and promote new skills. Libraries to run advocacy programs. Because citizen science needs a certain level of, of advocacy. Our bespoke prototype is following these areas of preference and to an extent areas of expertise. But what is ultimately the real value of bespoke? Well, it drives research beyond the academic and research organizations. It creates a broader community around research practices and policies. It nurtures a community of curious minds. It educates people beyond traditional curricula. It consolidates trust in research. This is very much needed nowadays. People will learn by working in citizen science, contributing in citizen science projects, will learn to distinguish between evidence and misinformation, between sustainable development and manipulation. People will contribute in citizen science projects in order to achieve societal goals. Ultimately, researchers will learn too to become better citizens and to contribute more to our society. We are confident we can develop with you tailored bespoke units and maybe a network of them embedding your expertise. The bespoke prototype is what we think it will deliver the citizen science single point of contact in your institution as recommended by Leru in 2016 through their advice paper. Thank you for watching and for attending this presentation. I will be pleased to engage in any further conversation with you together with my team at SKS. Don't hesitate to contact us whenever is needed. 
Here are my contact details and I welcome your questions and inquiries. Finally, we used some images in this presentation and would like to display credits for these images. Thank you once again for watching. Okay, um, we have some questions and I will start with, uh, with um, first of all, with one comment, if, I, if you allow me. Um, Tatiana Kolesnikova from Library Dnipro National University of Railway uh, is is saying Tiberius Signat, thanks for the library Dnipro National University of Railway Transport Ukraine. This is very interesting. So uh, thank you very much, Tatiana, for this comment. Obviously, we have people from Ukraine as well. So great regard and great cheers to people there. And hope you enjoy uh, this uh, session. Um, now we have um, a few questions. And the first question is uh, the first question is about uh, uh, how citizen science are linked, uh, how citizen science is linked with maker spaces and libraries of things uh, in university libraries. How, how, how can we connect all those, let's say, um, uh, models to, to one uh, system? Can you hear me, Miro? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. I, I, I have some technical difficulties. This is why it's right. So I have to say that I couldn't hear the, the, the comment. Um, okay, and, okay, and I, okay. I, I, I apologize will, I for this. I, I can go to the question or uh, it, uh, please let me know. I, I will repeat the comment because I think it's very important for you as well. We got some comment from um, uh, Library Dnipro National U University of Railway uh, Transport, Ukraine. Uh, they just uh, thank you, uh, Tatiana Kulesnikova said, thanks for the library, Dnipro National University of Railway Transport. Uh, this will, this is uh, very interesting. So uh, once again, great regards and cheers to the Ukraine. Uh, it's glad to see and we are honored that we have uh, also uh, participants uh, from abroad. And uh, yeah, uh, now the first question was, about um, integrating uh, integrating citizens. yes maker spaces and uh, let's say library of things to the uh, uh, to the citizen science let's say to the to the citizen science activities in uh, university in in a library I I will say yes uh, I um, I have to say that in 2018 I was invited in Edinburgh to to give a presentation at. Um, uh, fringe um, repository, which is, which is a, a quite famous uh, conference on research data management, and I benefited uh, for a visit to the um, to the library at the university uh, in Edinburgh. And one thing, uh, the library director was uh, very proud, and he had all reasons to be so. It was the makers' corner, and I know that you also have one in in Ljubljana, and the makers' corner was linked to citizen science activities because people were allowed to come there and create tailored uh, devices. For example, for uh, activity, field activities, you may want to put a, to fix a camera on a uh, place which is not uh, an obvious one for which you have all the, the pods and the devices and you need to create something. And for that, you need um, a kind of a maker's corner, a small laboratory where you can uh, create such devices. Uh, but this is uh, also uh, part of universities that, or universities that are not supporting in an um, uh, organizational manner citizen science. So we can say that although if you have such a corner is greatly supporting citizen science. On the other hand, uh, internet of things, uh, it was mentioned. Of course, we want to be uh, linked with smart devices around us. Um, I would like to, to come back to Huma's presentation. And yes, we want to be uh, linked with such devices, but we need to be careful what these devices are taking records of. Mm -hmm. 
because it could be surprisingly that um, some devices are accessing your uh, microphone, uh, your SD cards without you, first of all, knowing it, and without you, secondly, understanding the reason why they access all these things. So citizen science is a big movement, movement is important, but at least it wants to contribute to, as, as, as long as I'm aware about this from researchers, is to, to contribute to more um, doubtful technologies, like persuasion technologies, uh, face ident uh, identification technologies that are not clear to us why we need them. Uh, it is an integration between citizen science and the rest, but the, the highlight that I will make about this integration is not on the hardware and device sys part, not even on software part, software part. The highest integration I would like to emphasize is uh, in education and skills. People need to understand more how uh, science is developed, how researchers are working, how researchers are establishing evidence. Uh, citizens should understand the right of researchers to explore bizarre, the right of researchers to fail. Citizens should understand how they can help, what kind of expectations they can set. People also should understand to make the difference between um, manipulation, for example, and sustainability. They should see that papers that are, for example, on um, uh, papers that are on uh, preprint servers, they should first understand the concept of peer review because someone could put uh, papers on preprint -pre servers. We saw that in United States with flat earthers and others placing papers in uh, uh, preprint servers that are endorsed by uh, public research organizations and then saying, look what researchers are saying. This, this is a paper which could be found on researchers repository. Uh, one, one recent um, example of that is a paper which is placed on Zenodo at this point and then it may, is made abused of. So this kind of integration I would highlight on skills and education and the role that citizen science plays to upskill the level of society of, under, of understanding and supporting science and then the integration with hardware and software. Thank you. Uh, Tiberius, another question. Uh, it is said you speak in a future time. When will best book, best book be ac active? Um, well, I think this is platform, but yeah, please answer. It is, it is active, but um, it should be understood the nature of bespoke. The nature of bespoke is uh, a prototype. So it's not a pret a porter platform. One thing uh, uh, I think is important to clarify, one thing we learned uh, scientific knowledge services by being part of scholarly communication for many years, and we do represent publishers, for example. One thing we learned is that it's not a wise idea to develop infrastructure for research institutions where this infrastructure, this kind of infrastructure could be naturally placed at uh, research institutions. So we don't want to develop an infrastructure to capture customers, clientele in that infrastructure. What we want to develop, it was a bespoke um, a prototype and we want to uh, develop uh, consultancy and implementation services for those that think there is a value in such prototype. Uh, you could see also the prototype is, uh, it's open, everyone could see it and uh, everyone could try to implement by, by themselves. So it's not a pret a porter it's not that you take it and you simply implement it. You, you, you need to understand it's a prototype and it needs to be, uh, it needs to be particularized, tailored to each institution, institution needs. That's why um, our co-speaker today, uh, Thomas Karstedt said, said that our bespoke, so their bespoke will not look the same as University of Ljubljana bespoke. It's a prototype and it should be adjusted, tailored, for, uh, in an implementation phase, phase to the uh, particular needs of each institution. But we don't build a, uh, uh, an infrastructure here. Thank you, Tiberius. 
Um, there are uh, 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 two additional questions, but I suggest that maybe because uh, it's they are very interesting for um, maybe from a point of view of other um, presenters that we discuss those questions also now through panel. And yep. if you agree, we will now move to uh, 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 a short panel discussion, uh, maybe to discuss some questions uh, we we were faced uh, through your great presentations mm -hmm. and also maybe some additional. Uh, but uh, before we start, I would like to uh, thank you for really, really great and powerful uh, presentations. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, we learned a lot and especially um, it is uh, absolutely um, uh, stunning how, um, how, how those ideas are, are now uh, very active and very, very uh, interesting in, in many countries around. So, um, Thank you uh, for, the, for the opportunity and for the stage. And I, I hope you didn't mind that I, I decided to, to play the video instead of making live. No, I would have, said, I would have said the same. Love Various, it was perfect. I mean, and and uh, absolutely, uh, the approach is very interesting. So Thank we you. learned many things through your presentation. I can say that <laughs> not only not only uh, about the subject, but also about the presentation. So it, it, it sounds perfect. It's usual. Thank so, you. and thank you to my colleagues for playing it. <laughs> so, if you agree, we will do. Yep. Um, uh, one or two rounds uh, of questions around, and um, I will start. Maybe I, I will ask you to unmute, or maybe to unmute when you speak. I think that all uh, presenters are still still uh, uh, online, so we can we can uh, briefly start. Uh, first of all, I would like to ask uh, uh, Huma, Thomas, Chert, and Marco because they are coming from universities. Do your universities support citizen science? Yes. In, if yes, how, how this support uh, looks like? How they express this support? Maybe just a brief answer. Shall, shall I go first? Shall I go absolutely, first? Absolutely, absolutely. Go ahead. Um, as Tiberius explained, not at the university level, it's it's about independent researchers involving citizen scientists. So at the moment, it's not at the university level. Okay, maybe Thomas. I think I briefly touched on it in my presentation or the questions. We get some seed money, uh, got uh, some political traction and have a few funding opportunities. Uh, so in that respect, I think we are probably more fortunate than Coventry, I guess. <laughs> uh, but to be honest, it's a daily uh, discussion, if not struggle, to get the attention and try to to get this over the line. Okay, in fact, uh, University of Ljubljana supports our project via Central Technical Library. Yeah, okay, <laughs> it's true. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, this is first, very first organization that moved us to this project, in fact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I really appreciate to uh, all guys uh, from your um, library, especially to Mitya Iskrich, uh, they really pushed us in the beginning and uh, they provide us first uh, platform uh, for uh, web presence was via C CTK. So this is... Uh, Really, really good work, in fact, of uh, CTK. Of, uh, but uh, fro on the other hand, uh, I have also some not very good experience from my, my colleagues, etc. But this is different story. I will not talk about this. Yeah, but uh, maybe I can turn a different page. Uh, in contrary, I must say that I have uh, complete and utter support from my faculty and indeed support from University of Maribor. Uh, they offer us uh, complete support from, from the resources, computational resources and even human help. So here I'm very fortunate and uh, I must extend my thank you to Professor Urban Bren who is uh, really, really supporting this project on the whole scale. So here I'm very, very fortunate. 
oh this sounds uh, very nice and uh, yeah promising for next projects uh, yeah okay um there is one question which were put yesterday in a slide of in, in it was the only question which came before uh, we we start today meeting uh, and it's about how presenters all of you see the role of funders research agencies ministries in promoting and encouraging citizen science because now i i, I think what these questions want to to, to ask because uh, agencies I, I think that means like you know slovenian research agency or research agencies um because up to now we have spoken only about let's say universities headquarters or institutions headquarters how those kind those level of of uh, uh decision makers should promote and encourage uh, citizen science uh i don't know i will start now with maybe with uh, tiberius and then if you if you comment uh, this question so i um i can i can uh, tackle this question from two perspectives one is the uh, aforementioned uh, uh, OSPP, Open Science Policy Platform, final report, which acknowledges, and I'm sure they, they studied this before with, uh, 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 with interviews and collecting opinions, which mentions that uh, citizen science is talked about, is considered, but is still at uh, initial steps. Apparently is insisting indeed, the Horizon um, uh, Europe is ins insisting on a, um, the uh, relationship between science and society. I am a, a happy participant in such a research project, which is led by uh, Huma and University of Coventry, which is under Horizon 2020. Um, but I would say that the calls which are supporting citizen science and which are encouraging citizen science applications are not tremendous uh, in numbers or in amount that is given. This is uh, this is one way of uh, tackling. Then uh, the, the other one is discussing with uh, uh, customers and discussing with um, funders. Uh, and even in informal conversation, the, the, um, the, the normal answer is that uh, we tried, we um, proposed uh, to uh, university directors, other decision makers, state secretaries and so on, um, to increase the level uh, of support for citizen science activities. And um, in public discussions, they were very favorable in uh, uh, more one-to-one -one discussions in the closer round tables. They didn't look of giving priority to this element of open science. Um, it, it was not seen as, as, uh, as serious as it is, for example, data management. I think this is a, a, a this is wrong. This is completely wrong. Um, I think uh, research organizations should understand their role in society, not being uh, not being isolated in a sort uh, of uh, uh, wonderful position where they are al allowed to do whatever to explore their curiosity alone and so on. I think they should understand the role in the society because the society is expecting from them to advance the frontier of our knowledge. And also, even if it's not obvious for everyone in society, it's, um, it's expected from research organizations to increase the understanding of uh, every single person about the importance of evidence. And we will have less manipulation, less misleading contacts on each uh, uh, walks of life, political, uh, industrial, uh, uh, military as well, less manipulation, uh, less abuse of, um, of sophies, if you want, if we have a, a higher understanding of how science is producing evidence. Maybe some, yeah, uh, Thomas, please. Just a brief reflection on, on this, and I'm not sure if I'm answering the question, but I just feel to say that um, at our citizen science group, we have a steering committee, which has the deans of faculty, which is, you know, high level management that are responsible for hundreds and hundreds of researchers. And the reason they invest a little bit of money and a little bit of prestige in citizen science is not because they think it will give excellent results, 
They do it because they are extremely worried that universities will get out of touch with the public and also, at least in Denmark, the taxpayers who fund us. And, and I think in Denmark, 3% of the BNP is used for research. But, but I think that gives another dilemma because although Horizon Europe apparently is coming up with a number of calls, in Denmark, there is not one single place in the grants opportunities, the Danish government, private sector, grants foundations, where you can apply for open-ended research. What you can apply for is um, applying for grants that can empower kids to do science in their spare time or in schools. So there is an asymmetry here, I think, for what we want to achieve, at least at a local level or a Northern European or Scandinavian level in, in what is going on. So, so I think there are room for improvement or at least an interest in discussion on some of this. Thanks. May I? Yeah, so I, citizen science, it is, it is growing, not just because the general public pay uh, through their taxes, to governments and the EU, so it needs to come down. But it is growing. For an example, just this year, th that's just one researcher myself, I've been involved in three proposals, not, not leading, just uh, being a partner on three proposals, two EU, one UK. The, the involvement of the citizen scientists have been in really um, uh, uh, diverse topics. One was AI ethics, obviously, uh, because of, as, as our colleagues mentioned, the, the really huge problem of fake news. How do the general public uh, d uh, determine what's real, whether it's health news, whatever? Uh, another one was on sports, on engaging uh, citizen scientists um, to stop bullying in sports. And another proposal that we're doing right now is about the problem of religious beliefs, where, you know, people are radicalized, um, you know, coming... I was born in Pakistan, so non-Muslim, but still sort of uh, know the Muslim. You know, I don't want to get into that, but, you know, to, to have a look at this, uh, uh, the radicalization. So getting citizen scientists involved. So I think it's, it, it's growing citizen science, uh, involving citizen science because of the problems in society, which have been sown by uh, uh, algorithms of hate. Etc. So it is growing. We we are going in the right path. Thanks. Uh, Chert, Marco. Yeah, I'm I'm completely agree that uh, citizen science is a very important part. Um, and uh, in fact, it, it will grow gr for sure. Uh, because uh, there is so many information to filter and it is impossible to filter correctly uh, why ma with machine. Uh, we need some neural network, but uh, not uh, um, but uh, new neurons from our brains, not in, in silico, in fact. Oh. I think Thomas uh, raised a hand if I uh, saw, so, okay. It was just briefly to humor. I think uh, in reality at our university, it's growing as well. Yeah. And there seems to be, we're doing a, uh, we have done a study or associate professor that Tiberius knows quite well, Christian Wittfeld has done a study in Denmark that shows that it's on the rise, it's getting more diverse and it's reaching out of natural science. But it's to say that, that, that um, at least in my experience, it's coming very much from below and I think that universities could be more supportive, do more infrastructure. And I think there is a need for, to push for that because we have some quite beautiful flowers at our university. You, Hume, you, Marco, everybody else probably has that. But it's a very fragile environment to grow things in. Mm -hmm. so, so it's guys like you that if you do not take up the torch and run with it, mm -hmm. not a lot of things will happen. And that worries me deeply if we want a long-term sustainable commitment to this. And that is sort of my only, my only, uh, we need to put it a little bit out of the inspirational activist structure into more focused, sustainable governance structure, mm -hmm. at least at my own uh, university in my own country. And, and I think that was the reason I commented on that. Good point. 
Yeah, uh, I, I agree completely. Yeah, I think uh, uh, people are sometimes talking about, I don't know, research endeavors, uh, decision makers about some uh, discrete, discrete, uh, uh, you know, spaces, but in fact, they are not. We are all uh, of the same organism and we should become aware of that. And I think citizen science is a wonderful way forward to bring all this together and to realize that we are actually a part of the same organism and we are breathing together. And that's the only way forward. Tiberius, please. Uh, very briefly, if I, um, I think it's, it's, it's not uh, too much to emphasize as much as we can to emphasize to um, uh, university leaders that communities are not, uh, um, communities are nurtured, communities are not managed, planned and developed as we wish. So if we don't start now, and we, as Thomas said, we want to, to have these communities and to rely on these communities to help when is needed, to listen to us when is needed. We cannot say, okay, now we need this community, we appoint a, for a community manager and this community manager is going to create a community for us. And maybe we give a team to, to her or to him and they will be uh, more powerful to create this community. No, a community, I can't stress more than this, is nurtured. It is nurtured. You don't know precisely how it will develop, but if you nurture in goodwill and with uh, good elements uh, in it, then you will have a, a community. Uh, and citizen science is, is um, it's hugely important in nurturing communities. Excellent. Yes. Tiberius, I have one question for you. Um, remember, uh, I think it wasn't last year, or it was last year in Geneva, uh, you organized a great session with uh, Dr. Iris about um, uh, collaboration. Yeah, about, uh, let's say, uh, changing uh, research culture. And we talk about transition from competitive uh, science to collaborative science. Mm -hmm. uh, can we see, um, let's say, citizen science within this context? And also, can we say that maybe also this transi transition, uh, which is very obvious right now, is maybe uh, also the reason for some dilemmas and some, let's say, um, concerns about citizen science uh, uh, in, uh, within researcher uh, uh, community. Uh, yes, br brief, briefly, um, when Leru started this push for open science and when uh, uh, not only Leru, but the Royal Society, they, they launched this open uh, research as an open enterprise report. Which is, um, which is a milestone for open science. Uh, they, they mentioned at that point the importance of uh, collaboration and there were various follow-up in uh, UK medias about the damage of too much competition in science and also in education, which uh, fabricated well-oiled research machines. Now we have examples, we needed a pandemic to understand the role of collaboration. And we also, for example, at the beginning of this pandemic, we as SKS, we put a COVID center on our webpage. It's still there where we try to keep track of uh, reliable sources of information about collaborative research uh, efforts. Publishers as well, they came up with some open access content, for example. So collaboration was all of the sudden disco discovered as a very important ingredient, maybe magic ingredient, for finding a cure of a vaccine to manage the, the pandemic. So now we want to say that collaboration is only good during pandemic times. No, mm. of course it is good for science. It, it could be defined. Um, and this is what center of genomic uh, structure is, is doing. It could be defined a pre-competitive collaboration stage, a stage where you collaborate different stakeholders and competitors they, for example, uh, in their center, they collaborate to find target molecules, and then they compete. This is their model. They compete to, to, the, uh, dis to discover drugs based on the molecules that they targeted, uh, they found as target molecules together. So it's, it's great to understand the role of collaboration and to put it at eye level with competition in research. No, no less than eye level, no lower, sorry, than eye level. It is as much as important as competition, this collaboration. Thanks. And so, sorry, to answer to your question, citizen yeah. science, of course, you cannot split the community saying, 
oh, hey, community, now you are working for me. Please be aware that uh, we have a competing project. If they are calling you for, for help, say no. There's no way you can do that mm -hmm. in citizen science. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And based on this, uh, I mean, the, the next question, which is very linked to this, your answer is um, about, uh, and also some questions were put in, in Slido about that. Um, um, uh, look, citizen science uh, should be a link between universities or institutions and uh, the uh, broader community. Uh, however, um, I think that this competitive science resulted with the, between those two uh, uh, subjects are a huge gap. Uh, and uh, there is still a lot of room for improvement uh, in this area. So um, how, how this process run in countries you are coming uh, uh, from, how the local communities are, are uh, connected uh, uh, to um, to the universities, not only uh, I, I, at, at this point, but but uh, uh, all all other connections. How how universities uh, promote uh, the them activities and 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 collaborate with with local community uh, uh, at all points of social life. Uh, for example, in Denmark or in UK. Please, Huma, go. Um, okay, so like all other universities, we have outreach activities and then, you know, we have a, a, a role. So, for example, although I work at Coventry University, I live in uh, northwest London, Harrow. So I'm a West, West London uh, science ambassador. So, you know, I've had the police checks, everything to allow me to go into school. So what that does is al allows you to go into schools. So from children as young as six and seven. Uh, right up to just before they're go going to move on to university. So not only do we talk to school pupils, uh, so we tell them, well, you know, this is what happens in universities. What would you like to do? Then there's also lots of festivals. Uh, so, for example, in Coventry, there's the annual Robot Day, which is held in Coventry Transport Museum, which allows the general public to go as well as uh, summer holidays, uh, engagement with families and children. So like all of the universities, um, there is this constant um, uh, outreach activities um, so that universities are, are not seen as, you know, uh, up on the hill unreachable. And we, we as researchers are meant to be accessible. So go out. Uh, you know, into uh, the, so for example, in my area, artificial intelligence, um, I have to think about how do I talk to six, seven year olds about artificial intelligence. So the way I did it, I said, would you like to talk to a robot? So I took um, some tablets, mobile phones, and I uh, gave them to the children and said, obviously I gave them a clean chat bot to talk to. I said, here, chat, chat to a chat bot. And then obviously for the older children, you say, should we have flying cars? What could be the uh, issues in flying cars? So th th this is one, one of the ways, you know, just outreach activities. Perfect. Uh, maybe Thomas, if you have some comment on. I think if I, when talking about the uh, support of universities sounded a little bit uh, pessimistic, it's because I know it has an insane opportunity here for outreach into society. And I think in reality, the, the work we have done the last three, four years show that the public in all sorts of civil sectors, private sector uh, schools are really, really interested in participating in citizen science. Um, I think we have a couple of examples where researchers go out and use kids, uh, school children from age 10 up till 18, not only as respondents, but participants and data providers. And then they provide uh, teaching materials, often online the other way around in order to engage teachers and do it in the curriculum. That works in our experience exceptionally well. But also uh, we have the good fortune to have no less than three regional media partners, sort of classical legacy media, radio, television, newspaper. And the good surprise is they are trying to engage the younger population because if they don't do that, it's just like dinosaurs. They will go out into extinction in a few years. So there's a huge potential of engaging them 
So I don't think we have done a citizen science project without any sort of media partner. And I think some of you mentioned also with a, with a local project in Slovenia, it's absolutely doable and possible. And what that does is it, it creates sort of a, a, a movement that other people want to be around this. Mm -hmm. So I, I kid you not, I think we have engaged 30, 35 partners of all different kinds. And what happens is when you get momentum, the local agencies, government agencies, whether it's the environment, whether it's uh, ethical questions, also with artificial intelligence, health science, we have a dementia project where we involve uh, the next of kin and the first line responders in this uh, to, to sort of get another look at how relatives can cope with, with having dementia in the family. It has this massive potential. Mm -hmm. And I think universities could grow this more and could tap into this more. But, but I think there is this sense that it's, oh, it's very nice to do this. And I think the platform needs to be moved from nice to neat. And that is, I think, my only priority here. Good point. Okay, thank you very much for your answer. Uh, interesting discussion. We have one question from the audience. Um, it is for Huma. Nearly entire online business model is based on advertising and personal data collection. Can you, can your initiative be successful without also engaging providers? Oh, you, you mean in our project? First of all, we in our project is we want to expose the extent of this business model, which is about um, extracting data without being uh, transparent. So nobody's saying don't extract data, but when it's appropriate. For example, as I explained, on the app that I use, TFL, Transport for London, so I need to give some data for it to give me data. So I need to give my precise location so it tells me when the next underground tube is down to Baker Street. So uh, the thing is, um, I don't think we need to um, engage the ad tech marketing right now. They are stakeholders quite rightly, um, in the citizen science stage where we're uh, uh, engaging them to investigate, we don't need the ad tech marketing there. Where we need the ad tech marketing is uh, in the stakeholder meetings that uh, Tiberius knows as well, because Tiberius will also be organizing. We're gonna have stakeholder uh, uh, citizen science cafes, parent teacher round tables because we want parents to know what trackers are on children's games or children's apps. We want teachers to know um, the websites that they might be suggesting to their pupils while we're online learning uh, educational platforms online, what trackers are in there. So in the stakeholder meetings, obviously then the ad tech marketing will be invited to say, look, people are starting to get wise about your business models and they're going to stop. They're going to stop using your products. So you will in the end lose out. So yes, we will be engaging them, but they're not partners in the project if that's what you're asking they're stakeholders thanks thank you very much um yeah uh my question is also about the uh let's say university excellence um and i, I would like to ask uh, so i have Basically, I have two, two statements. And please correct me if I'm wrong or please comment those two statements. The first statement is that um, citizen science projects are mostly applicable ones and promote and visibility research organizations in the wider, broader environment. And also the second, based on that, citizen science projects improve excellence of research organizations. I don't mean uh, improve maybe excellence uh, regarding, let's say, points or, or I don't know, a uh, uh, number of citations, but regarding my, I think, regarding, um, let's say, uh, social impact uh, in, a, in a local community. Uh, what do you think about this? Please. <laughs> It's a symbiotic relationship. So, of course, the production of new knowledge goes back into teaching. So I teach um, AI students, computer science students. So the new knowledge also helps the citizen scientist to 
understand the scientific method that even when you're babies, you are scientists because you're exploring your world, you're exploring your environment, you're hypothesizing. So for example, oh, that looks interesting, I'll touch it. Oh dear, I got burnt. So you you know you're testing your hyper. So even babies. So we are we are scientists even from very young age because we are observing and testing our environment. So it should carry on with involving the general public. It's not only is it expanding their knowledge, um, so so they're better informed and can make better in uh, decisions, but it's also feeding back into teaching. Um, uh, uh, class students as well. So it's symbiotic. It's not just impact factor for university researchers. Mm -hmm. Tiberius, please. If I, if I may, it depends on how you define excellence. Yeah. Uh, uh, as I said, if, if you are referring to um, research assessment exercises, and then if you define excellence in a in a uh, quantitative uh, index-wise uh, way, then of course you will have people who learn the ropes and they will create excellence based on that, uh, on, based on, on that definition because you create the so-called well-oiled research machines. You know the criteria, you learn the ropes, you, you put yourself in that system and you, 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 you obtain excellence uh, in that. But universities are not supposed to be uh, well-oiled research machines and are neither research organizations that are not uh, universities. I think one of the uh, most fundamental role of universities is to produce generations and generations of curious minds mm -hmm. and yeah. to, peep, uh, to keep these people entertained with the prospect of a great discovery. And creating this generation and generation of um, curious minds involves um, uh, an engagement between science and society because you broaden um, your reach from a number of students to a society. So in that case, if you see, it, uh, if you see excellence under that definition, citizen science couldn't be better positioned to create excellence. Thanks. Thomas. I think uh, Hume is absolutely right. It's a symbiotic uh, relationship. And I just checked out uh, your, your COVID-19 site, uh, Marco and, and, and friends. And, and it struck me that, I don't know, was it 50,000 or 500,000 people or interactions that have been? Wow. And, and, and that is, that is I mean, that also represents some sort of data that you probably wouldn't get in any other way. Mm -hmm. And when you check out some of the other platforms, uh, the Open Humans platforms of, 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 of just one giant lab with the guys that they're doing. It's just a massive community of people compiling data, which in the end should presumably provide better research or better results or more tangible results. And, and, and I think it, it cuts both ways. We, have, we had an associate professor in, in, uh, uh, in water quality and the environment do a teaching program, which meant that she locked 400 lakes. The biggest study that she ever done before was 12 lakes. So it's just to say that, that it cuts both ways. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very easy to get researchers to invest in this when you show the upside that you are not only doing it for the public, you're actually also doing it for yourself and your data quality. And, and that way it's a cliche, but it's a win-win. Uh, and, and I think that's quite easy to to point out, and, and, and Marco, I'm, I'm quite curious what your experience is here. What, what were your, do you have any takeaways from your own project on this? Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, we, are, we are very pleasantly surprised by the involvement of the community. And of course, uh, each project must have a very, a very uh, sound background. And of course, a very solid background. Uh, if a problem is not well defined, then, then it's probably not a good idea to place it uh, into the wider public. So yeah, uh, indeed, um, the, we, we got a large amount of data and we this project also enables us to exactly as Tiberia said, to nurture a community and to uh, build context with other, uh, I don't know, uh, very similar uh, thinking scientists and uh, nevertheless people uh, all, all the same. And here uh, we are very, very pleasantly surprised. Uh, amazingly uh, how a community built itself actually. 
and uh, now we just hope to give back and to uh, to uh, produce good science with it and uh, exactly and uh, we will do our best as we can to push this project forward to use this uh, model for novel scientific questions because I think this is the future as I said before we all work in a symbiotic environment and we should be aware of that and I'm very glad uh, that we did this and I'm very hopeful for the future yeah Okay, uh, I would like to ask you also another question, uh, which is uh, for me, I mean, this is my personal opinion, please correct me if I'm wrong, but it is like, you know, for me, it's very important. Um, now, citizen science promotes not only research activities, uh, let's say with voluntary researchers, uh, etc. But for me, is citizen science also knowledge uh, and skills uh, represents also knowledge and skills. Uh, uh, how to how to use, let's say, uh, knowledge content generated by universities? Because for me, the the, the main reason, the, the the main let's say uh, uh, mission of universities is is to 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 um, to uh, let's say generate new 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 knowledge, new content, new knowledge, and and and. Um, it's it's very difficult. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm very sad when I see that let's say some uh, um, uh, thesis, uh, let's say uh, uh, doctor thesis or something, uh, a PhD thesis are put uh, to uh, some some uh, uh, deep uh, in 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 a, in a cellar in, in in library and they are not used. We, I, we are faced with lack of metadata, with, with lack of uh, access to those uh, knowledge, etc. So my question is, uh, how are dissertations and theses uh, uh, of your universities accessible to broader community and how this uh, is implemented to the, to the uh, society and the knowledge implemented to the society? Please, Huma, go ahead. Okay, so uh, because uh, taxpayers fund our research, our science, our, our, our articles, activities have to be made public. So the universities uh, in the UK, they use different platforms. So Coventry uses Pure, P-U-R-E, -E, Pure platform. And there, the researchers, we have to put up our, um, you know, our journal articles, conference papers, etc., etc. Then there's also Academia Edu. ResearchGate and Tiberius recently introduced me to Zenodo. So um, these, obviously these platforms, pure, they are known to other academics. You are right. How do we make them known to the general public? So on Academia Edu, uh, my PhD has been downloaded, that, you know, over like 900 times, but then the, the Turing test is, uh, is always like, you know, a controversial thing. But yeah, how do we get it to say local libraries? I never thought of that. So it sounds as if like making an extra copy of the PhD thesis and taking it to a local library, that costs money. I, I, that's the thing. But the platforms that universities have, we are obliged to make our publications our public accessible to anybody. Some other comments? Tiberius, please. Uh, I, I would like to, to emphasize, and it was great that uh, Huma illustrated uh, with, with uh, the example of her uh, university. Uh, I, I would like to highlight the importance of responsibilities that are coming in the same package with the decision of open, opening up research content. Uh, I think it's, it's, there is no discussion, there's no doubt that a research uh, communication includes a specific jargon, which I also mentioned in my, uh, a discipline specific language in my presentation that is not accessible to the general public. Yeah. Not only that, but also the general public is not aware about uh, the peer review, uh, in what is peer review and what play it roles in uh, scientific communi uh, communication and in, in for sci scientists to communicate. So all this um, opening this uh, wealth of information to the public comes with the responsibility of stakeholders and libraries are, is one of the most important stakeholder in that respect to make people aware about P 
peer-reviewed and non-peer-reviewed content mm -hmm. to, to content which is agreed by other scientists of being valu valuable and the content which still uh, continues the, the, uh, the conversation, still continues the, the, the question if that, uh, uh, the, the, that family, uh, family of statements that form a, a scholarly communication are um, valuable. So uh, then you will have people pick and sharing what is most convenient for them, ignoring uh, what, uh, uh, if the material is peer reviewed or not, and then start to promote their own interest with, with picked and cherried uh, um, uh, scientific literature. So open access comes with the responsibility of educating society uh, about what uh, is valuable and what is not yet established as value, valuable content. Any comment on? No. Then if not, I can say that we will now slowly close our session. Uh, we are still in time. So uh, I would like to thank you to all of you for a great uh, presentations and also for great discussion now. And I think that this discussion is not end. I am also very glad because I can say that there were, there were very uh, intensive chat. There was very intensive chat uh, in our Zoom session. So uh, uh, the, the, the also very important aspect of such conferences, networking also function uh, right now here. So I'm, I'm sure that we are not, this is not the end, uh, the, the, the last time that we, the, we sit together. Um, I, I would say that we got uh, more than 87 uh, uh, participants which, uh, oh. uh, which follow us, which followed us uh, uh, via YouTube. Uh, now there is the 63, but uh, the, the most highest number was uh, 87. I, I, I can say also that we obviously had uh, participants from abroad, uh, from Ukraine, uh, maybe from some other countries. So really a, a successful meeting. Uh, we learn day by day, not only about citizen science, about science communication, but also about how to have uh, uh, communication within problems we are now uh, uh, in uh, with COVID. Um, and I, I hope that Marco and Chert will uh, uh, support our uh, researchers to in invent COVID vac vaccine uh, as soon as possible, but this Zoom uh, uh, session will stay as powerful tools. So uh, I think that we did a great job today. So thank you very thank much you. once again. Thank you. And thank you. hope see you very soon with glass of wine or glass of beer here in Ljubljana and talk about this uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, subject uh, uh, lift, uh, lift. Thank you very much and have a nice time and stay safe. Thank you, thank you, you too. Thank, thank you, thank you everybody. everyone. Thank you. Bye for now. Keep Bye. safe. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Strokovno srečanje z naslovom Skupnostna znanost, most med raziskovalci in širšo skupnostjo je v sodelovanju s Kopotenčnim centrom odprta knjižnica, organizirala Centralna tehnička knjižnica Univerze v Ljubljani, v sodelovanju s Centralno medicinsko knjižnico Medicinske fakultete Univerze v Ljubljani. Um, in za na koncu bi vas radi vsi povabili tudi v CTK, namreč CTK je odprta tudi v teh težkih časih. Knjige lahko rezervirate tudi v naprej preko modula Moja knjižnica, e-pošte ali telefona. Gradivo lahko tudi pošljamo po pošti, če poste na območ v Ljubljane, pa vam ga lahko tudi brezplačno dostavimo. Dosegljive so tudi vse ostale storitve, kot so informacijske storitve, medknjižnične izposoje, bibliografije raziskovalcev in delo osih za tehniko in druge. Čitalnice do nadaljnega ostajajo zaprte. Vabim vas da še naprej spremljate CTK in naše projekte na naši spletni strani in tudi na državnih omrežjih. Na koncu pa ne pozabite všečkati tega videa in se naročiti na YouTube kanal CTK. Hvala in nasvidenje.